tonight at 10, one of the biggest debates of the election campaign has just taken place with exchanges on immigration, security and the future of public services. The debate included Labour's Jeremy Corbyn and featured repeated attacks on the Prime Minister for refusing to take part. She was represented by Amber Rudd. Some of the clashes were over stagnating wages and austerity. Amber Rudd seems so confident that this is a country at ease with itself. Have you been to a food bank? Have you seen people sleeping around our station? Have you seen... They just have to take on some of Jeremy Corbyn's fantasy economics. I mean, he has this money tree wish list in his ma manifesto. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister, campaigning in the West Country today, defended her decision not to be in Cambridge for tonight's debate. I think debates where the politicians are squabbling among themselves doesn't do anything uh, for, uh, for the uh, process of electioneering. I think actually it's about getting out and about, meeting voters and hearing directly from voters. We'll be asking what impact tonight's debate will have on the election campaign with just eight days to go. Also on the programme, the breast surgeon sentenced to 15 years in prison for performing completely unnecessary operations on patients after inventing or exaggerating the risk of cancer. Over four years of trauma and stress, in trying to bring this man to account, no amount of prison sentence will ever compensate what myself and the other people affected have gone through. At least 90 people are killed in the Afghan capital Kabul after a truck bomb explodes in the diplomatic quarter. And curbing carbon emissions is President Trump about to withdraw America from the Paris climate change deal. Coming up in Sports Day on BBC News, Arsenal majority owner Stan Kroenke says Arsene Wenger is the best person to manage the club as his new two-year deal is confirmed. Good evening. With just eight days to go until the election, one of the biggest debates of this campaign has just taken place in Cambridge. There were seven party representatives involved, including the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who'd announced earlier in the day that he would, after all, be attending. The Prime Minister, Theresa May, did not take part. She said she'd rather be out meeting voters on the campaign trail. We'll have more on the day's campaigning in a moment, but first, tonight's debate. Here's our deputy political editor, John Pina. Guess who came after all, and what an entrance. Jeremy Corbyn left it late, but how could he resist trying to show up Theresa May, who stayed away, maybe make up for the odd campaign gaffe. This was his chance, and look at him. He meant to take it if he could. She came to stop him, her leader's favourite, Amber Rudd. Fewer fans, but a bigger motorcade, and a single mission, take down Jeremy Corbyn. Wherever Theresa May was, she wanted this, the nearest thing this election has to a contact sport, to go her way. Amber Rudd was straight into the attack after Mr Corbyn criticised treatment of those on disability benefits. You're not credible Jeremy, Jeremy, I know there is no extra payment you don't want to add to, no tax you don't want to rise, but the fact is we have to concentrate our resources on the people who need it most and we have to stop thinking, as you do, that there's a magic money tree. You have to be accountable for the, strong, of the exactly money you want to spend. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to bring in some of the other parties. It was already a personal confrontation. The Labour leader counter-attacking on poverty. I would just say this, since Amber Rudd seems so confident that this is a country at ease with itself, have you been to a food bank? Have you seen people sleeping around our station? Have you seen... Because of your government's of course, conscious decisions I have been on benefits. Jeremy, for Amber to say that this is a government that actually cares for those most vulnerable, mm. I think is downright insulting to the kind of people that I see my, in my constituency surgery. This, though, was a seven sided <laughs> debate. Brexit was inevitably a big issue tonight. Passion and heat from all sides. We have to get the population under control because if we carry on on the road we're on, we'll have a population of 80 million by the middle of this century. Now, you just think, 
what will happen? There'll have to be a huge school building programme. There'll be, have to be new hospitals, new motorways, a new rail network, new houses. We're already having to build a house every seven minutes simply to keep up with the numbers of people coming to this country. Okay. And I'm afraid that UKIP keep using this issue. They want to whip up people's hatred, division no. and fear. And that's why they talk about no, immigration I've got to come back all the time. I've got to come back. I think this debate shames and demeans us all. I don't think there's anyone in this room or anybody watching this debate from Cornwall to Caithness who does not understand the positive contribution yeah. that people have made to this land who've come from the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. And demonising those people is totally unacceptable. And the rug took her opportunity. If Theresa May had come along, she'd have said what her stand-in said next. And I was thinking how chaotic it would be if they all got together, formed a coalition, and tried to run a government. What, and tried to form a coalition. And you you do. A Tory UKIP coalition. Jeremy Corbyn was put under pressure. He'd come to apply pressure of his own on pensions. You've said very Are you going clearly, to protect the Jeremy, law? Jeremy, have you not read my manifesto? I'm happy to give you a copy after. I'd love to have one, but the I'd like is, the answer now. Are we've, you we've, going we've to protect said, the No, they're going to get rid of it, Jeremy. They're going to get rid of it. Terrorism was always going to be a hot topic, and it was. And I am shocked that Jeremy Corbyn, just in 2011, boasted that he had opposed every piece of anti-terror legislation in his 30 years in, in, in office. My opposition to anti-terror legislation isn't opposition to protecting us from terrorism. It is simply saying there must be judicial oversight over what is done in our name. You right. cannot there is. give... There is. It got heated. UKIP's leader demanded more action against extremists from Muslims. Too much for Tim Farron. You have to, Paul, we have to, you know that the we have to rebuild trust Monday. and confidence you know, Paul, in prevention. You know, Paul, that the murderer last Monday was reported five separate okay, occasions by the Muslim community. Caroline they want Lucas our safety as much as anybody else. Then it was over. No knockout blows, but this fight's heating up. Just a week to go. John Pienaar, BBC News, Cambridge. So, as we saw, Amber Rudd represented the Conservatives in Cambridge tonight. The Prime Minister spent most of the day campaigning. She visited the West Country, where she was challenged about not giving enough detail on her party's policies. Mrs May insisted she was listening to voters and rejected accusations that her decision not to go to Cambridge tonight was a sign of weakness. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, reports on the campaign trail. There is flash photography in her report. London. 9am. Days to go. A rare sight these days. An old-fashioned press conference. Labour attacking the Tories on public services. Patients are suffering ever longer waits and overcrowded wards. Those who need care have been left without it. A&E maternity units and whole hospitals are threatened with closure. Children are crammed into overcrowded and crumbling classrooms. Schools are sending home begging letters to the parents. It has to change. Rather than preparing or even considering tonight's big debate, Theresa May was up early with the boats. Then a campaign classic, sampling the produce at the county show. Notably, the Prime Minister on the road today in parts of the country, the southwest, the Tories are trying to defend. But elsewhere, Labour and the leaders' crowds are enjoying being the insurgent underdog. It's about 11.30 and we're on the road in Reading. This rally of people packed waiting to hear from Jeremy Corbyn. It's just a case of, vote for me, uh, not that horrible man. But <clears throat> I've come to see the horrible man because he's not horrible. He's very sensible. He's like, really relatable to people and like, he understands what like, the young people really want. Their hero's welcome, ready to commit that he will debate with or without the PM. I invite her to go to Cambridge and debate her policies, debate her record, debate their plans, debate their proposals, and let the, and let the public make up their mind. On the move, but heading the other way. The Prime Minister won't respond to heckles or agree to those chanted demands to show her face tonight. <laughs> Staff at this factory in Bath did try to put her on the spot but applauded when she was asked about not showing tonight. But could she really laugh it off? <laughs> Look. <laughs> He's now up for a 
head-to-head -head debate. Doesn't it suggest that you're frightened of taking him on directly if you don't go too? No, as you know, Laura, first of all, I've been taking Jeremy Corbyn on directly, uh, week in and week out in Prime Minister's questions. Secondly, actually, yes, public scrutiny is for an election campaign, but that's why taking questions from members of the public who are going to be voting on the 8th of June is so important. The risk, she just looks scared. Isn't your decision not to take part in the debate tonight a bit of a metaphor for your whole campaign? You're very happy to repeatedly criticise the Labour Party, but for your own plans, you're reluctant to give us very much detail at all, whether that's on Brexit, your future immigration system, how many people will use your winter fuel allowance. What I've done in terms of our manifesto is been open with the British people about the great challenges that we face as a country over the next few years and beyond, and how we will address those challenges. And you talk about the Brexit negotiations. I've set out very clearly what our 12 objectives are for those Brexit negotiations. I believe that's the right thing to do. Don't people want more from you? Because you're basically saying, on many of these big issues, I'll get back to you. I think what we owe to people is to be open with them about the challenges we face as a society and as a country, and be open with them about the solutions that we're offering. But in campaigns, the path is so often less smooth for those who start out in front. Laura Kinsberg, BBC News, Bath. And we can talk to Laura now. She was at the debate in Cambridge. And will it change anything, Laura? Well, Sophie, I spoke to some of the audience here tonight after the end of the debate, including some Tory voters, and a couple of them were clearly very frustrated that Theresa May hadn't bothered to show, and in reverse, very pleased that Jeremy Corbyn had made the effort to turn up and to debate the other parties here tonight. And I think it's pretty clear that in terms of today at least, Jeremy Corbyn has had a tactical win. He's been seen to seize the initiative and come along and take part. I think it's too early to say, though, how that's going to play out with the wider election. It. Those people who weren't following every twist and turn of tonight's debate, those people who hadn't necessarily paid much attention to what the lineup was going to be, who the political players were all going to be at this big major event. And in the spin room tonight, where members of the press were watching and senior politicians were trying to claim victory for their person, it hasn't felt really like a wake or a celebration for any of them. And I think the truth of it is really none of the seven politicians on stage tonight had a cringe worthy disaster, nor did any of them, including Jeremy Corbyn, have some kind of big breakthrough moment that really feels like it will have a huge impact on the course of this campaign. And I suspect, Sophie, by the time we get to the actual election, tonight might be remembered as the day when Theresa May didn't turn up, rather than what for what anybody who was actually here actually said. Laura Koonsberg in Cambridge, thank you. A breast surgeon is beginning a 15-year sentence in prison tonight for carrying out needless and life-changing operations on nine women and one man. Ian Patterson, who's 59, exaggerated the risk of cancer, in some cases invented it to persuade his patients to consent to surgery. Although the case related to 10 patients, it's thought many more could have been affected. Our health editor Hugh Pym reports. A rogue surgeon who thought he was untouchable. He had the total trust of vulnerable patients, but he maimed and mutilated them. Now Ian Patterson is behind bars. He caused me to have 23 operations. Some of his victims who suffered from the operations he carried out gathered before the sentencing this morning. Then they marched together into Nottingham Crown Court, determined to see justice being done. Many warned of a cancer risk had breast surgery, which proved to be unnecessary. They sat in court watching Ian Patterson, head bowed in the dock. Sentencing him, Mr Justice Jeremy Baker said, in pursuit of your own self-aggrandizement and the material rewards it brought from your private practice, you lost sight of the fact you were carrying out significant surgical procedures upon your patients. You deliberately played upon their worst fears, either by inventing or deliberately exaggerating the risk that they would develop cancer. The court also heard that his former patients endured pain and discomfort, with some suffering long-term complications, anxiety and depression. I lost my home, I lost my marriage, I lost my health, I lost my job, I lost absolutely everything. He, he took everything away from me. He may never know the real reason why he acted in such an evil way. 
throughout the trial, he has made no attempt to show any remorse for his actions and may be revealing his true character rather than the charming professional man we all thought he was. Some questioned Patterson's 15-year prison sentence. He should be released on licence after seven and a half years. We've all been given a life sentence and he's just going to walk away a free man after seven and a half years. And yet every morning we look in the mirror and the scars are there to remind us. So I think at the least he should serve the 15 years he's been given. For the victims, the battle doesn't end here. Their lawyers are preparing a High Court civil action to be heard later this year, seeking damages from the hospitals and Patterson himself. Solicitors say they're acting for around 600 former patients, but more may come forward, and the total number of victims could be a thousand or even more. So could there be another Patterson? Medical regulators say there are much tougher safeguards now with regular staff appraisals and surgeons working in teams who can challenge them. The safety net we have now in place is a very different one than existed at that time. Does it provide an absolute guarantee against people committing criminal acts? I can't give you that absolute guarantee, but what I can say is that if people do perpetrate such criminal acts, I would feel very confident that those would be picked up very quickly indeed. But private hospitals where Patterson and other surgeons work are still not strictly regulated, according to medical leaders. And even as he began his prison sentence, there have been calls for a wider inquiry into how patients were so badly let down. Hugh Pym, BBC News, Nottingham. At least 90 people, most of them civilians, have been killed and hundreds more injured after a massive car bomb attack in the Afghan capital, Kabul. The country's president, Ashraf Ghani, called it a crime against humanity. The bomb was detonated near Zambak Square in the heavily, heavily fortified zone during the morning rush hour. It struck the city's diplomatic quarter, damaging several foreign embassies. No one has admitted carrying out the attack. This report from our correspondent, Caroline Hawley, contains some distressing images. You could see from miles away the force of this explosion. A massive bomb at a busy Kabul intersection, hitting commuters on their way to work, children on their way to school. It was a bomb so powerful it shattered windows up to a mile away, leaving a trail of horrific destruction. One witness said it was like an earthquake. There were so many casualties. Security vehicles had to double up as ambulances. The Afghan government said hospitals in the capital were in dire need of blood. I was working in the office when a powerful blast happened. I collapsed under the desk and received injuries from shattered windows. Most of the dead and injured were civilians, including many women and children. Among those killed is Mohammed Nazir, who worked for the BBC as a driver. The BBC said he was a popular colleague with a young family. The area where the bomb went off is supposed to be one of the most secure parts of the capital, walking distance from the presidential palace. The BBC's Haroun Najafzadeh was at the scene soon after the attack. It was a water tanker or a lorry full of explosive that hit this strategic location right in the heart of Kabul. It's very close to the German embassy, Indian embassy, French and British embassies. And even in a country that's become painfully used to violence, the scale of this attack has been a shock. Security in Afghanistan has been deteriorating for some time. Most of the country was under government control back in 2014, when NATO ended its combat mission. Since then, large swathes of territory have fallen to the Taliban. Most of Helmand, where so many British soldiers lost their lives, is now in Taliban hands. So is much of the province of Kunduz, and IS has established a presence in Nangarhar. The Americans have over 8,000 troops in Afghanistan. The UK has about 500. But US commanders are now asking for several thousand more. At one point, we had even 150,000 foreign military boots on the ground. That did not weaken or destroy the Taliban. So a few thousand more today is not going to be a solution. Yes, in the short term, it is going to give some support and better training to the Afghan government and Afghan security forces. But the insurgency will still be there. Afghan intelligence are blaming an affiliate of the Taliban, the Haqqani network. But no group has yet admitted to carrying out one of the worst attacks Kabul has ever seen. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. 
President Trump is preparing to pull out of the Paris climate deal to combat global warming. That's according to media reports in America. Donald Trump has not confirmed those reports, but he said he will make an announcement in the next few days. Pulling out of the climate accord signed in 2015 was one of President Trump's key campaign pledges. Well, our correspondent Nick Bratt is in Washington for us. And if he does indeed do that, what will it mean? Well, Sophie, the indications tonight, as you say, so far unconfirmed, is that the question being mulled by Donald Trump is not whether America would draw from the Paris Accord, but how it will uh, remove itself from the Paris Accord. Under the terms of the agreement, it's a three-year exit process, but the Trump administration is said to be considering a nuclear option of opting out of all of the UN's climate change negotiating framework that would short-circuit the process. It would happen in the space of a year. Now, climate change scientists are saying that is potentially calamitous. It brings close to the day when the planet reaches dangerous temperature levels. As one climate change scientist put it, the global warming noose tightens. And there is this additional concern that other countries will follow America's lead. Only two are outside the Paris Accord at the moment, Syria and Nicaragua, and that other nations might not be so committed to the emissions targets which have voluntarily. And that's partly the reason why there is talk tonight of a new green alliance between Beijing and Brussels, uh, the EU and China, to make sure the climate change agreement doesn't fall apart. And this has huge ramifications for America's global leadership. Donald Trump has chosen isolation on arguably the biggest issue facing the planet. Nick Bryant, thank you. Now, it's a war that's largely been forgotten, but Libya's descent into chaos of, after the fall of Gaddafi six years ago has created a broken state and a breeding ground for terrorism. It's been exploited by so-called Islamic State, who've been drawing in young men like the Manchester bomber, Salman Abedi. He'd only recently returned from Libya when he blew himself up. Our Middle East correspondent, Quentin Somerville, has been talking to another man from Manchester, a former friend of Abedi's, who travelled to Libya not to support the Islamic State group, but to fight them. His report contains flashing images and scenes which some viewers may find disturbing. Libya's been ripping itself apart for years. Much ignored, it seemed far off. But we are more involved in this fight than we ever realised. These home videos are from Benghazi and one faction, the Libyan National Army. It's a foreign war, but this fighter is from Manchester. The boys from Moss Side became Libya's soldiers. Mohammed El Sharif has taken up arms against Islamists, including the so-called Islamic State. He left Manchester in 2011 and never went back. People at that time, whoever wanted to come to Libya, I knew he could, he could come to Libya. Just come, go book a ticket to Tunisia, book a ticket to Egypt, book a ticket to wherever, and then just get a taxi into Libya. And once you're in Libya, they know you're Libyan, that's it, nobody can talk with you. It's your hometown, it's your city. This is home now. Drugs are widespread, dulling the monotony and the wounds of young fighters. In this madness, the Islamic State is waiting for the right moment and the right recruit. Make sure they don't go to that path, if you know what I mean. It's like, if you need them to do what they do, there, there's people that are looking for your young lads to blow themselves up, to do stuff like that. They're going to find them, they're going to convince them, they're going to make them do and do and do. Yeah, that's, that's Salman, Salman now. That's Salman right there. That's Salman. He was once good friends with the Manchester bomber, Salman Abedi. But they chose different sides in Libya's war. They haven't seen each other in five years. The fighting changed both men. I've been in war for over three years. I've seen so much blood. I wouldn't go blow myself up. But life here is warped. Mohammed was filmed proudly desecrating IS corpses. Uh, you posted a video on Instagram. Um, tell me what happened. Why did you shoot those bodies? It is wrong. It is, obviously, what can I say to you? I do regret it, but 
what can I say? They deserve to die too. They deserve to die because they killed so many people. The journey to here from Manchester was quick and it was easy. These two worlds overlap. Mohammed stayed in Libya, but Salman Abedi brought the violence back home with him. Libya's chaos won't be contained. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, Eastern Libya. Back to the election now, and the largest unionist party in Northern Ireland, the DUP, has launched its manifesto, promising to work for the best deal in the Brexit talks. The party also pledged to make tourism a billion pound industry and called for a public holiday to celebrate Northern Ireland's centenary in 2021. The DUP's leader and former First Minister, Arlene Foster, said she wanted a mandate for talks aimed at restoring power sharing at Stormont. But above all, she said the election was about making sure Northern Ireland remains in the UK. On June the 8th, I'm asking people to get Northern Ireland back on the right track, to vote to get the best deal for Northern Ireland, to strengthen our hands in the upcoming negotiations, to get the Assembly back up and running, to protect our place within the United Kingdom and to unite behind one strong unionist voice. Northern Ireland's Alliance Party has also launched its election manifesto promising progressive and pro-European politics. The manifesto includes a series of commitments on power sharing in the Assembly, the economy and justice but focuses on Brexit. This is a manifesto which pledges to oppose a hard Brexit support a special deal for Northern Ireland and which will give the public the final say on the outcome of those Brexit negotiations. Now, the way we consume our daily news is changing with a growing generational divide. Nowadays, younger voters are relying less on newspapers and more on the internet and social media. But does that make them more prone to so-called fake news? Our media editor, Amal Rajan, has been finding out. Yes, it's Fleet Street. But how many of you know the inside story on the stories you read? Once home to Britain's newspapers, for decades Fleet Street provided the lifeblood of our body politic. Those are vanished times, of course, thanks to the digital revolution. But for all the talk of the death of papers, the presses are still rolling. Read by nearly 8 million people in Britain every day, papers often set the wider news agenda. These days, the Daily Telegraph is much more than just a newspaper. But in its printed form, it still boasts nearly half a million readers, the majority of them conservative inclined, with an average age of 57. If we wield any influence, it's because of the, the influence of our readers, and we're lucky to have many of them, and many of them are influential. It's true that uh, print circulation is in decline somewhat, but we still sell more than 450,000 newspapers every day. Even as their print circulations fall and they move online, titles like The Mighty Telegraph still wield enormous influence and have a hotline to number 10. But there is another conversation going on during this election, one in which websites with a very different following tell a very different story. One such website is Squawk Box. Its anonymous author, a hard left member of the Labour Party and pressure group Momentum, spoke to us on the condition that we would preserve his anonymity saying he operates below the radar of traditional media and fears for his family's safety. Many of his articles go viral, with some achieving hundreds of thousands of readers. The way that social media works, and Facebook more than Twitter, um, is that you've got this kind of, you know, these uh, Venn diagrams, the overlapping circles of people's um, spheres of influence and acquaintance. And that person might be somebody you're already preaching to the choir, but their auntie or uncle who sees their Facebook feed might not be, their friend that they're connected to from work, and it's that overspill around the edges of people's social media circles that, that, that interests me because that's where the message gets out and you get a chance to actually change opinion. With a lot of these sites that are popping up, their entire purpose is to destroy the status quo. They don't want to give a fair hearing to both sides. They don't want to engage with the opposition. They don't want to uh, have the relationships that journalists traditionally do with politicians. Their entire purpose is to smash the system. In the UK, the older you are, the more likely you are to get most of your news from TV. But a comparison of print and online shows a growing generation divide. The younger you are, the greater the dependence on the internet for news. 84% of young people mostly get their news online, with social media playing a key role. Just 4% of the same age range turn to newspapers first. 
the headlines are fairly sensationalist, they're fairly emotionally charged. In analysis published this evening, researchers at the Oxford Internet Institute conclude that so far British voters are getting less false or misleading news on Twitter than Americans saw in last year's presidential election. It's not as big of a problem as it was um, in the States. Um, we found that in, uh, in the lead up to this election, people are sharing quality news, so news from professional news organizations, and that's 53% of the total content shared. Uh, junk news has been around 13%, so a big difference there. Social media have created echo chambers, where younger and often left-leaning audiences find an alternative news agenda. The balance of power within the news ecosystem is shifting their way, even though many politicians are yet to realise. Amol Rajan, BBC News. And finally, Arsene Wenger has signed a two-year extension to his contract as Arsenal manager, bringing an end to months of speculation about his future at the club. Fans had called for him to go after a disappointing season for Arsenal, but last weekend's FA Cup victory may have saved his job. Our sports editor Dan Rowan reports. He's already British football's longest-serving manager, and now we know Arsene Wenger's remarkable reign at Arsenal will extend to a 23rd year, the season's most contentious saga finally over. Amid fierce debate among the fans, Wenger refused to face the media today, his club instead releasing their own interview in which he explained why he was staying. I uh, identify myself so much with the club that, uh, of course, uh, when you can be where you love to be, uh, that's easy, uh, difficult because you want to respond to the demands uh, of all the people who love this club. The pressure on Wenger has intensified this season. Arsenal humiliated in Europe and failing to qualify for the Champions League for the first time in 20 years. With the highest ticket prices in football, the fans' fury boiled over. Last weekend, Arsenal unexpectedly beat champions Chelsea to win the seventh FA Cup of Wenger's tenure. Arsenal have broke once more! But his decision to stay has left the fans divided. His uncertainty has caused the players' uncertainty in the dressing room. You know, we, it's, it's, it's all wrong. He should, he, should, he should have just gone after the cup final. Arsene Wenger needs to earn the right now to get the fans back behind him. And uh, that's what we're going to be waiting to see. Today is a reminder of the immense power that Arsene Wenger wields here at the Emirates and his task now must be to keep Arsenal's best players, to invest in new ones and to justify his new contract worth an estimated £16 million. After 10 major trophies it's become hard to imagine Arsenal without Wenger but 13 years after they last became champions his legacy hangs in the balance. Dan Rowan, BBC News. Well, that is it from us now on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Good night.